In the realm of tech, as Tar takes the stage, Hashem al Gaili, a sage for the age. From Yemen to Germany, his journey's been vast. In science communication, he's truly unsurpassed. Facebook fame, millions know his name. In the world of science, he's got serious game. Simulation, the great escape, his latest book's call, a dive into tech that will enthrall us all. Today, we'll explore from AI to space, the future of tech and the human race. So sit back, relax, let your curiosity unfurl as we talk to the man who's enlightened the world. Hashem, thank you so much. Such a pleasure for joining Test Automation Experience. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Nikolai. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, I saw that, uh, well, maybe we talk, mention a little bit story of how we first met. Um, we met in Poland at um, InfoShare conference. Uh, I think some topics that you and I had in common were AI. So we were staying in the same hotel, started chatting and then hanging out there and continue to talk about AI. And um, I found out that you're a very passionate science communicator and I'm not a science communicator, but I'm in technology so we can kind of relate. And so we kind of created that bond. And so I saw that on LinkedIn and actually even before that, it was really cool because you were telling me about a book that you were working on writing and you were just kind of giving me a little preview of the book. Um, and then a few months later on LinkedIn, I see that you posted that your book is now released. And I was like, wow, that's so amazing. I got to invite Hashem on here. Yeah, to talk about his book, Simulation, The Great Escape, um, and tell us all about it. Well, um, yeah, I still remember the great time that, um, you know, we had in uh, Poland. Great conference, amazing people, lots of interesting talks. And um, we talked a lot about AI, yeah. which happens to be part of the book as well. And um, I'm very excited about it. The book just uh, came out. Um, less than, I mean, almost a week ago, basically. And I'm really excited about it. Awesome. Yeah. And we are excited to learn and hear about this book, but before we do that, um, I've got a few rapid fire questions for you. Shoot. <laughs> All right. Question number one, what's one technology that you think is overhyped? One technology that is overhyped. I think it would be the metaverse in its mm. current format. And I think it's a, a long shot, uh, but in its current format, it's just hype. Mm. Very interesting. Yeah, I think many people would agree with you. Um, if you could have dinner with any scientist that are alive, who would it be? Uh, Brian Cox. Brian Cox. Astrophysicist. Awesome. And why is that? He has a lot of interesting uh, things to talk about. And I think having a conversation about whether we live in a simulation would be quite intriguing. Mm, very cool. Yeah. Uh, last question for you. What's the most mind blowing scientific fact you've ever learned? That you can create a human entirely from a skin cell. You can take the skin cell, you can program it into stem cell, and then you can convert that stem cell straight into an embryo. And just think of how many cells, skin cells you have. It's the largest organ in your body. And you have trillions of skin cells, basically. And each one of them has the capacity to become a human being. You are a moving population, basically. Right. It's quite interesting. And the, the right environment, you could become billions of people. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. I had no idea about that. So maybe the audience here, uh, my audience is, you know, developers. We talk a lot about technology, software development. We talk about AI and the future as well. Uh, but maybe many people are not familiar with you, who you are, how you got to where you are today. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey. So I started communicating science in 2009, back when I was still uh, doing my bachelor's in biotechnology. I was uh, in Peshawar University in Pakistan. And, you know, I started simply by sharing content with my friends on Facebook. They were not interested, actually, most of them. <laughs> 
I started posting on Facebook groups and, uh, you know, groups for biology, astronomy, physics. And then people from these groups started following me. And that, you know, uh, started, that's how it started to uh, grow. And in 2015, I converted my Facebook profile into a page because a Facebook page provides you insights on what the audience likes, what they don't like, what they interact with more. And I thought that these insights are very helpful. So I use that for my own uh, content sharing strategy. And back in 2015, Facebook started focusing on video content and I decided to completely switch to uh, video content, which contributed to the growth of my uh, social media channels. Now, the thing is, I still remember the first video that got 8 million views and was blown away by the numbers. And that was a strong incentive to continue posting videos. I remember one week when the page was followed by more uh, nearly 2 million in one week. I was like, wow, incredible. All from a single video. Um, the competition back then was not as much as now, of course. So that's one of the reasons, you know, when you adopt something at an early stage, it really helps. Uh, you know, then I expanded my activities to other social media platforms like uh, TikTok, uh, Twitter sometimes, to be honest, I'm not. So Twitter, or now they call it X. I need to highlight that it's now called X so that we know that this interview is still recent. Um, so, uh, you know, YouTube, also um, LinkedIn, where you saw the announcement about the book. The, you know, I, I share science content in the form of videos mainly, but sometimes I try different things like creating concept yeah that could be in the form of either infographics 360 images um or more recently 3d animations i love to experiment with new things and the book is also part of experimenting with new things and um right now my social media channels stand at more than 34 million followers and more than 20 billion views which i'm really thrilled to say have contributed a lot to enhancing public uh, knowledge on various topics that concern science and technology they were also very important during the covid 19 pandemic because we needed a lot of communicators at times you know in, in times of need so uh, yeah that's that's about my journey wow that's pretty amazing nine million views on your first video that's right yeah. That's pretty fantastic. How many followers did you have in your group at that time? 27,000. Wow. That's, that, that's a viral video right there. Yeah. Cause I it know. was, you might be asking what's that viral video. It's yeah. about a diver underwater and he's standing between two continents. Yeah. He's touching the two continents with his hands and, uh, yeah, people went crazy for that. I loved it. Yeah, that's that sounds pretty cool. It already makes me want to watch the video to see what that's all about. Yeah. Also, you know, never forget your origins, huh? Mm, <laughs> that yeah. video will always have a special place. Yeah, that's am that's amazing. And uh, uh, just another curiosity: what has been your most popular video? Actually, one of the most popular videos is a very yeah, it's the, it's two videos, I would say, that are in the same level of popularity. One is airplane safety system, which is basically a detachable cabin. You know, you have the plane and you have the cabin. In, in, in case of emergency, the cabin detaches. And of course, the pilots may rest in peace, but the cabin detaches and there is a parachute that takes it to safety on the ground. Okay. And that went viral. It was designed by a Russian. Then the other video, which uh, uses amazing animations to show the development of the human fetus. And um, 
I, I gathered all these amazing animations of month by month stages of human development, compiled them in an awesome video, described the process, and used very soothing music. And every month it's picked by Facebook to just get more reach and more views, and it just never stops to bring new views and followers. I just love it. Amazing. That, that's super cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about your book, the one that you just released, Simulation, The Great Escape. Um, tell us more about it and why you were inspired to write it. All right. So Simulation, The Great Escape is my, uh, I think I picked up the one with the shiny uh, yes, cover. Yes. That's right. <laughs> okay. So in 2017, I wrote and directed a short film called Simulation, which you can now watch on YouTube. Okay, it's about us living in a simulation. I am always excited and intrigued about this hypothesis. You know, we watched The Matrix and uh, I remember watching it for the first time and that conversation where they describe that we live in a matrix and you have the blue, the blue and the red pills I was blown away. Uh, it's just such an amazing dialogue there. Um, but recently, there has been a lot of talk about whether we live in a simulation or not. And I've been reading about it a lot, and I got inspired to create a short film. So I created the short film called Simulation, which is now uh, available to watch on YouTube. For anybody who wants, you can just go to my channel. Uh, it received a lot of international awards, best VFX, you know, best uh, uh, editing, best music, uh, best short film, best director. I just uh, love the fact that it was well received. However, that film was too short to tell the story. Yeah, because creating science fiction comes at a cost. You know, visual effects and whatnot. It's 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 very expensive process, um, and it's just twenty three to 25 minutes long, uh, not enough to tell enough, you know, not enough to tell uh, a good story that is compelling, but it's like an introduction to the world that I was about to create. The plot for simulation continued to develop in my head, okay, for many years to come. I would think about what happened after the last shot in the film, okay? And I would constantly write ideas for it until I had a concrete story, but it was still in my head and, you know, one day I was talking to a friend about the story. I said, you know, here's a, here's a, the film, watch it. He watched it. He said, it's great. I said, okay, let me tell you what happens next. I'll tell you more about what happens. I told him more about the story. And he said, you know, what? you should really write it as a book. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, okay. And then COVID-19 uh, COVID came. We were in a lockdown. It was a perfect opportunity to... Um, just go ahead and uh, write the book. I wrote the book. I pitched the idea to a few publishers. Nobody, of course, responded. So I decided to bring in um, editors by myself. I brought in the editors and um, we started editing until we got it ready, you know. And uh, only recently it was published and I'm really excited about it. That's amazing. Um, I'm excited to read it as well. Uh, can you maybe read us a little blurb? Uh, from the book? I would read the blurb. Uh, this is the blurb, which is basically the summary of the plot. Okay. Estranged from his family after the tragic loss of his daughter, renowned astrophysicist Thomas Ernst buries himself in his research. He investigates a vast dark region of space known as the Great Void, where stars and galaxies never formed, making it the most exciting puzzle of 2492. Theories suggest it is home to violent black holes that could engulf the Milky Way. Other clues point to the void as the origin of alien artifacts peppering our solar system tied to the disappearance of multiple explorers. Obsessed, Thomas is convinced the death of his daughter is connected to its mysteries. Then the Voyager 17 space probe returned startling data, 
or in tombs and covers the hidden truth locked within its transmissions, his superior censure him, and the international government impugns him, denying his findings. Fired from his research career and facing threats on his life, Thomas focuses on the reason behind their cover-up. He, his unexpected discovery challenges humanity's understanding of free will. If he cannot give the word out in time, the non-universe will cease to exist. Does he have what it takes to challenge the deep state, or is the universe doomed to vanish into oblivion? So, we have a main character named Thomas, an astrophysicist. His daughter died in the middle of a very important research that is doing connected to a mysterious region called the Great Void, which is a dark region in space. There are no galaxies, no stars. Why? They want to understand why. Maybe there are black holes that are eating all the matter, and these black holes could come to us and eat our solar system too. Yeah, so they want to understand what's going on with this region. But his unexpected discovery is a challenge to his superiors and the authority, and he's faced with multiple challenges. Um, so yeah, is he going to go with his gut and tell the world and try to save it, or is he, um, or he does he not have what it takes to do that? That's amazing. Sounds like an amazing story. I hope you're going to send me a signed copy for free. Consider it done. Yes. <laughs> That's the only reason I wanted to bring you on the show. I'm like, I'm going to ask for a signed copy. Well, you got it then. <laughs> I'm going I'm to ask it for in recording so that he has to commit, you know? Well, then I out. can say that the show has achieved its uh, first objective, getting <laughs> your copy. Second objective is getting people to get their copy as well to enjoy the story. <laughs> yeah, abso absolutely. I'll definitely put a link in the show notes and we'll throw up a QR code on the video as well so they can grab their copy of uh, Simulation, The Great Escape. Fantastic. Thanks. Appreciate um, it. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure, Hashem. Thank you for uh, sharing all of that with us and telling us about the book. And I'm sure a lot of us are very excited to read it. Um, I can't wait to hear people's thoughts on it once they finish reading it. Yeah. Um, all right. I have another question for you. So uh -huh. you've amassed a huge following on social media for science communication. What's your secret? Well, you know, um, I would say the secret is patience, right? Consistency, uh, novelty. You have to always, uh, try different things you know people get bored of the same thing all the time adaptability because the algorithm keeps changing and you have to adapt to these changes um and incredible visuals when you create incredible visuals that are appealing to the audience they can be images they can be videos you've got people's attention it's as simple as that yeah Sometimes visuals are coupled with terrible content, but the visuals sell themselves. But when you combine that with really good content that matters to people, then um, you've captured their hearts and time and attention. Um, so I have always been posting content that matters to people, I'd say mainly. Medical technologies, latest breakthroughs about science, and I've always relied on authentic sources of information People trust the information that I post, and um, yeah, they come. They come for additional details. I remember during the COVID nineteen when there was a lot of misinformation and spread of misinformation. Uh, the number of returning visitors to you know who were coming was in the millions. It was just amazing. They would come and they want to know the latest updates on COVID nineteen. I would also host scientists and researchers who are expert in these fields and have done that many times. Um, it's also diversity of content. I don't stick to only one type of content. I like to diversify. Sometimes I post 360 images, infographics, weekly summaries, you know, science summary updates, um, science fiction. Sometimes I mix it also with uh, real science and uh, it's a way 
of engaging people with the content and make them making them more interested in science and yeah it's it's all about uh diversity as well diversity in the types of content you share yeah one thing that i've noticed from your content is the quality of the video the audio the visual effects is just they're almost like little miniature miniature movies where they keep you glued to your seat to see what happens next over the little duration of the science information that you're trying to share, which it just makes me kind of like see how amazing creators, how they amass such massive audiences is just creating fantastic content that people enjoy to watch. That's kind of like at the end, it's like just create an amazing product that people are very interested in and do the, I mean, do yeah, the that's best. what you ask yourself before posting a video. Is this something that I'm going to watch or share with my friends? If the answer is yes, then go for it. Now I have to say that there are times where I thought that some forms of the content that I've been sharing have become outdated and I need to refresh that, uh, like the text with music and footage. It's kind of, you know, there are videos with text and music and footage. There are people who love these ones. Yeah, especially if you're in an office and you don't want to listen to a narrator talking and you just want to read the text sliding from one side of the screen to another. They still work. Then there is the narrated uh, content. Then there is the narrated with heavy editing. Then there is the narrated content with extensive original animations that take weeks to create. And... Um, I just like to, to do all, all kinds of things because, yeah, if you do just one type of content, it, it's boring, not just yeah. to you, but also to the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Makes, it makes total sense. Amazing. And, and it shows in your results. Um, what do you think are the top three emerging technologies that you're most excited about? I would say the first one is AI. I, I mean, knew, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. I mean, you have seen the incredible progress AI has come, you know, um, it has come really very far in, in the span of one year. Just with the emergence of chat GPT, everything just exploded. Now we have AI tools that can clone voices, make them realistic, just like humans create videos from images, completely generate incredibly realistic images, create incredible art. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I mean, generative AI is changing the landscape and it's not just about content. It's, it's about a lot of things. It's about, uh, AI being involved in medicine. Yeah. Improving diagnostics, for example or AI being involved in scientific research, for example, uh, in biology, instead of testing millions of proteins that could serve as a single drug for a certain disease, you can use AI to narrow down the list to five or three that are more ideal, and you can just test them in the lab. This saves time, resources, and effort. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the biggest challenges was predicting protein structures in biology. A protein structure changes, okay? When it comes in close contact with another protein, they bind together, they change. Let's say there is a, there is a drug that you want to develop, but you want the perfect protein that binds to that target, okay? And you don't know how to design it, or you don't know where to find it, use AI, it will design it for you. A process that takes 14 years can now be compressed in a few hours. It's, it's just incredible. So AI and everything it, 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 it offers, everything that it uh, brings us is very exciting. That's the first technology. Second technology is genetic engineering. And we're talking about CRISPR-Cas9, we're talking about all types of uh, genetic modification tools, which will not only change the way we treat diseases. I mean, they have been doing that for a while, but 
they will also change many things that are outside uh, the medical field, like agriculture, you know, creating plants that are resistant to climate change, or creating plants that can grow in hostile environments, like on Mars or the moon, so that colonists, when they go there, they will use genetic engineering and uh, use genetically modified seeds. So genetic engineering is changing our lives drastically not a lot of talk about it as much as ai but it's equally important the third take that i'm really excited about is um quantum computing and quantum entanglement think about the incredible processing power that these computers are going to bring and when you combine them with current existing ai models we're going to take it to the next level nuclear fusion this is a new type of energy generation that will provide us unlimited source of energy. It's the power of the sun on planet Earth. Think about that. There are so many things that we could accomplish if we have sufficient energy. Sometimes energy crisis is an issue that stands in our progress and uh, making giant leaps in tech. And science and so solving the energy crisis will be incredible but we're not just solving the energy crisis with a nuclear fusion we're also solving it with a clean form of energy people often you know remember Chernobyl and say oh no nuclear is not the safest but scientists disagree in fact they say nuclear energy is the safest form of energy and nuclear fusion is the feature that I'm really excited about. I actually used it in one of my concepts called Sky Cruise. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's an airplane, a massive airplane, a flying hotel. It's a cruise, but it's flying. Okay. I, I posted it online and it became an internet sensation. Everyone was just talking about it. It was trending for a week and it was covered by a lot of. Uh, uh, TV channels and engineers alike as well who wanted to discuss the engineering behind it and whether it's uh, uh, feasible. Um, so yeah, imagine a powerful, huge plane in the air powered by a nuclear fusion that doesn't have to land and just continues flying in the air. Yeah, sounds amazing. Sounds like a, a cruise in the air. All of those technologies sound amazing. Um, and I'm curious for the AI part, because I know especially a lot of developers here on the channel, they mix, they're mix. they mixed about AI. So many of them are scared. Many of them like it. Some of them are confused, which is normal, right? Probably what's happening all over the world. Um, and you're probably even more knowledgeable about all the AI tools that exist out there. What are some of your favorite AI tools that you can recommend us to try to enhance our day-to-day -day life? I mean, I mostly use them for uh, content creation, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I use Eleven Labs, for example, for voice cloning and narration. I use ChatGPT for summaries, you know, for um, uh, repurposing some of the text that I write to make sure that it's in the best format and in the most engaging format as well. Um, what are the other tools that I also, uh, I also use mid journey a lot, you know, generating images and thumbnails. Um, I use AI tools that generate 3d models and 3d, uh, that generate 3d models and create textures for 3d models. So most of my need for AI revolves around content creation. And uh, I'm not sure if most developers would, would align with that, but um, it's amazing. You know, I saw people developing programs with chat GPT and I think all developers must embrace this rapid change in this sector. The thing about AI, there will be two types of people. You have got those who oppose it and they will be left behind because they did not embrace it early on. By the time they realize the gravity of their mistake, it will be 
a little too late. Yeah, because others have already embraced it early on. AI evolves so rapidly and you need to catch up every single day with these new changes in these models. And then there will be those who embrace it. They don't use it completely to replace their process, but they integrate it as a complementary uh, option into their process. They use it in addition to what they are doing to enhance what they are doing. And these are the ones who will excel. And then there are those who completely ditch their old way and switch completely to AI. I don't think these ones are also going to make it because we humans still need that little touch of humanity to whatever we create, basically. Yeah. Everything is just robotic and mechanistic. It's just not going to be easy. So I would say we should all embrace AI and we should integrate it into our process, but not use it completely to replace what we've been doing. Use it to improve the way we do things and improve the outcomes, improve our efficiency and uh, accuracy on what we do. Yeah, that totally makes sense. For me, like a future that I see for developers, but many even maybe even for a lot of different jobs is you might be like a developer managing a team of some junior engineers and a lot of the work that those junior engineers can be performed by AI. There's also some teams that are maybe you need some social media created. Maybe you need some kind of a a roadmap or a plan created. You can use AI to create all of that. And so what I see the future is potentially instead of being a manager of like a team of engineers, we'll be managers of, of a team of AI bots and collaborating all of those together in order to deliver our product in a faster, more efficient manner. All right, uh, another question for you, Hashem. Um, what advice would you give to young people interested in a career of science communication? Well, first of all, I would say the landscape has changed since I started. Yeah. First of all, people use AI in their work now. So you have to learn how to integrate that into the science communication process. Second, you need to read a lot. Yeah. Um, Find what you're, what you're interested in, what you're passionate about. It could be physics, it could be biology, biotech, it could be astronomy, it could be chemistry, and try to stick to that. For me, I honestly publish about all of the scientific fields because I'm interested in all of them, even though by trade, I am a biotechnologist. But still, if you really stick to uh, your field, that would be great. The next is uh, learn video editing. Many AI tools now are making video editing very easy to do, much faster, more efficient. So learn video editing, focus more on video content. That's how science is communicated now. People watch more videos than read articles or do anything else. Yeah. Um, be responsible with the information that you share. Uh, it's very important because you could get lost. You could uh, be uh, persuaded or you could um, you could find incentives in spreading misinformation. And there is a lot. So trace the source. Make sure that the source is authentic. And make sure that you are responsible when you share because this information that you share will spread like wildfire. And you will be responsible if people are sharing wrong information, especially if it concerns their lives, you know, a medical advice or something like that. You don't want to do that. And finally, networking. Networking is very essential. You need to um, build a network with like-minded people, start partnerships, share content with them, create content with them as well. Um, one additional advice that I would say is adoptability, which I mentioned earlier. Algorithms are always changing. New social media platforms are emerging. Keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on these changes and adopt to them because that's, that's what uh, will help in your growth on social media. 
Amazing. Thank you for that advice, Hashem. And I got curious just because I have to do some of my own video editing for these kinds of videos as well. Uh, what tools do you like for video editing? Well, normally I use, for me, mainly I use Adobe Premiere Pro. And it has tons of amazing features now that use AI, uh, like uh, subtitles. Previously, you would do them manually. Now you just immediately create them, you know, from the uh, audio itself. You can change the style. That's amazing. There are AI tools that help you scale, upscale the video. If it's in a very bad resolution, you can scale it up. Relighting the video, you can do relighting as well. It's just incredible. Um, you know, you can you can uh, brainstorm with ChatGPT to uh, help you with writing the script, and it can really offer incredible insights and tips that will help you speed up your uh, workflow and at the same time create engaging content. Um, there are also tools that you know you can use ready-made plugins and ready-made project files that you can just optimize for your needs. You can find them. There's one of my favorite websites called Invato Elements, and they have a lot of uh, plugins and tools that can help in optimizing the video editing process. I also like to use uh, Adobe After Effects to create animations and motion graphics. And um, yeah, these, these, these are the helpful tools. However, there are people who are just beginners and they don't want to spend money on buying the license for Adobe Premiere Pro or Adobe After Effects. So what do they do? They can just go to the free options. For example, DaVinci Resolve, you know, the basic, all the basic needs for editing, you will have them in the free version. That's amazing. Then you have CapCut. This is the one that most people use now, CapCut. Um, you can download it in your phone, you can download it in your computer, and it's fully free. And it has incredible tools that sometimes uh, surpass, I, I, to me, sometimes they surpass Adobe Premiere Pro even. So, um, yeah, there are free tools if you are on a budget or you don't want to spend money. And, uh, yeah, just go for them. And finally, there's a lot of tutorials on YouTube in all of these tools and others. So make sure that you uh, learn from YouTube. Spend some time there. Actually, I learned um, 3D animations from YouTube. And that's why when you see my uh, 3D animations like Sky Cruise or Ectolife Artificial Womb Facility, I created all the animations. And I did so using Cinema 4D and Octane Render. These tools are amazing. And I learned them online. Everything you want to learn is available online now, and you can go there and watch it for free. Amazing. Thank you for sharing so much valuable information, Hashem. Um, where can people go to get your new book? And also, where can people learn more about you? So you can get my new book on Amazon. It's available there in three formats. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and hardcover. Um, now, before you read the book, make sure you have an open mind. You're interested in science as well. And uh, enjoy the story. There's a lot of puzzles and suspense and action and adventure. Um, the feedback has been great so far. Uh, so, yeah, it's on uh, Amazon. As for the you know learning about me, you can just follow me on social media. Uh, see my posts. You will learn a lot about me from the type of content that I share. Or just go to uh, hashim com. That's my website where I have a portfolio that highlights some of my work. Amazing. Thanks, Hashem, so much for coming on the show. Congratulations on the release of your book. It seems fantastic. I'll be waiting for my signed copy whenever you get around to that. Um, yeah, thanks again for everything. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you. Um, great to catch up virtually this time. It's it's funny how uh, the first time we met was in real life and then the second time virtually, which is usually the opposite way around these days, right? Usually you meet everyone on a Zoom call. It's and then at some point in the future, <laughs> yeah. you meet in real life. But our relationship started the other way. And so 
um, I'm glad that it did. I'm very happy to uh, to have been part of your podcast. So thank you so much for all the amazing questions. Really, really enjoyed the uh, conversation about uh, all things, you know, technology, social media, uh, innovations, uh, the book as well. Uh, so thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care, Hashem. Bye-bye. Hey, and thank you so much for tuning into the Test Automation Experience. If you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to give the show a thumbs up subscribe down below. And if you have any questions about what you saw, any comments, comment below. I respond to every single comment. And thanks so much for your time and see you next time. <music>